morning and welcome Clearview. Bonjour, ni hao, salam, annyang haseo, kosh amadid, bienvenido, swagat her. I welcome you in the many languages that reflect the beautiful diversity of God's people. So wherever you are today, we welcome you in the strong name of the living Jesus Christ. What we do in worship is we meet with the living God and we bring all of our lives to God, the good, the joyful, and the hard, and the ugly parts of our lives. Here in Canada, we've had a pretty hard week as some very horrific realities came to light and we want to bring those before God. This morning, we take a moment to grieve with the First Nations of Canada the news that an unidentified grave of 215 children has been found on the grounds of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. The devastating pain and loss this news triggers is not just isolated to Kamloops, but it is shared by all who have lost family or friends or community members to these Indian residential schools. So many Indigenous children never came home from schools when they were forcibly taken. And the weight of that trauma, that loss, has wrecked Indigenous communities. And the church has shared a large role, and that still causes such intense harm today. And so as Christians who call Canada our home, we can't look away. We can't say it has nothing to do with us. Our hands weren't on the shovels that dug that mass grave, but our lives here in Canada are built on that history. So we need to learn how to listen and pursue reconciliation with all our strength. But this morning, we begin our worship simply grieving and lamenting. 215 children formed in the Creator's image. And so this morning, we're going to begin our service by marking two minutes and 15 seconds of silence. And I encourage you to use this time to hold before your heart the hard, ugly truth of 215 children dead. Hold before your heart a posture of repentance, asking God to change our hearts so that we care passionately, so that we pursue justice with all that we have. And then after two minutes and 15 seconds, I'll lead you in a prayer.
creator God of love and justice, comforter of those who mourn. This week we've learned of more indigenous children lost, more children who were never able to return to their families from schools they should have never been forced to attend in the first place. This news is devastating, God. And so we pray first for the healing of the children's families and communities who are met once again with pain that no one should ever have to bear. And God, we acknowledge the actions of your church, our complicity in running residential schools and taking children like these who are just found from their families. We repent from the pain and the ongoing harm we have caused, and we ask for the will and the wisdom to end that harm. We've asked for forgiveness. We've committed to work for healing and reconciliation, but we recognize, God, that for many, for those 215 children, that change came too late. And so our simple prayer is, Lord, have mercy. Comforting God, we pray for healing in the communities and families of all who experience residential schools. Comfort for all those who are grieving and strength for all to pursue reconciliation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray and we worship. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Stay. 
and welcome to our online service today. My name is Elaine Vinlar and I'm the Director of Discipleship here at Clearview Church. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been introducing Summer Church and so would like to take a couple of minutes to explain what Summer Church will look like on a week-to-week -week basis and invite you to consider joining us and attending this July and August. At the time of filming this, we're waiting with eager anticipation for the Ontario government to give a COVID update and hopefully provide an indication of outdoor gatherings. We're hoping and praying that we'll be allowed to gather in small groups of 25 to 30 people so that as the Church of Clearview, we can once again gather in person, albeit in smaller groups around our cities. Summer Church will have many of the same components as a regular worship service. For example, as people gather outdoors on the grass in a park or in a backyard, there will still be a call to worship. We'll sing a couple of songs together, either with a soundtrack or if you're lucky enough to have a real musician or a singer in your group with a guitar or maybe another instrument. There will be a group prayer time. Everyone, kids, teens, adults, everyone will be encouraged to share their requests, which will then be offered up to the Lord. Scripture reading will follow, and then a facilitated conversation about the sermon. So speaking of the sermon, each week the summer church participants will be sent the sermon so that everyone can watch it ahead of time. The facilitator will then lead a conversation on the scripture passage and the sermon that everyone has been able to see. There may be additional prayer time, but then the worship time will end or the service will end with ascending and blessing. So we've got all the components of a worship service. To date, we have secured summer church leaders for Glen Abbey as well as Burlington Bronte. There are potential groups in Mississauga and Falgerwood College Park. If you're interested in facilitating or hosting, or even helping with the coordinating of Summer Church, please send Pastor Phil or I an email. We'd love to give this Summer Church experiment a try to gather our church together for in-person worship, 
continue growing in our faith, and thinking of ways to bless our neighbors and neighborhoods. So stay tuned, Clearview. There's details on how to sign up coming soon on the website as well as in our weekly e-news. And one last announcement for this morning. Today for Kids Ministry and tonight for Youth Ministry, these are the last Zoom calls for the ministry year. We want to thank all our families for helping your kids grow in faith by attending these amazing ministries, even during these complicated COVID times. And a huge shout out to all our leaders who love the kids and who desire to equip them and bless them in their walk with Jesus. Please consider joining us on Sunday, June 27th for a special milestone service as we celebrate what God has been doing in the lives of the children and youth of Clearview. And now we turn it over to Christy with a special kids camp announcement. Hi, I'm Christy Dodd, Director of Children's Ministry here at Clearview Church. I am pleased to announce that this summer we are having an online virtual camp called Treasured learning that you are priceless to God. The camp is for kids grades one to five come September. It's from July 12th to the 16th, and there is no cost to join. We invite you to come on out and have fun. There's gonna be crafts, activities, games, and lessons. We're gonna learn that God knows us, God hears us, God comforts us, and a whole lot more. So please go to the website to register, spots are limited. See you there. Now kids, this is a little time just for you. Kids, isn't it nice to have friends? Friends that you can spend time with, maybe go for a bike ride with, maybe go outside and play, maybe color and do crafts, talk to, perhaps even pray with. Friends are great. Well, today I want to sing about our friend, somebody who can be all of our friends, somebody who's the friend that we can trust no matter what, because sometimes our friends in life can let us down, even maybe they don't even mean to. But you know what? We have a friend who's always there for us, who can always trust him, and he, he's there for us all the time, and that's Jesus. So right now I'm going to play this small video clip and I invite you to get up and sing and dance along. A one, two. Morning, everybody my name is Jane Burke I've had a really rough time this year I don't know about you my husband died a, four and a half years ago and that has only compounded the loneliness this COVID thing has and made it really quite hard to deal with 
I have one thing really in my favor, and that is I have a lot of cloth. And I am a quilter, so I thought, well, I am going to sew. So I scrounged around, I found 40 uh, patches. These patches come from uh, 1800 to 1900, a span of 100 years. They're all different, different fabrics, different patterns, different occasions for which they were made. So I decided to put them all together to symbolize my life's journey. So there was no pattern, no picture to follow. I just made it up as I went along and here it is. And it's so stunning. And it just makes me realize that God can take all these bits and pieces of our life that make no sense, such as COVID today, and he can put them together into something really, really beautiful. This one here, this big square on the floor, that's the very first one I started in March with COVID and all little tiny squares put together. I just love it. It's from 1880, all these little squares. And then there's a, another one from, from the 80s, never put together, and a fantastic quilting done just on a plain piece of fabric. Then there's African-themed ones, which uh, Africa is very close to my heart after our trip there some years ago. This is another one I finished. It was not nice and I changed it all around. So God can change us all around too. Here's another one. These squares are from 1870. There's a 356 different colors of squares. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Thank you, Lord, and thank you to all the people who've helped me stay upright during this really tough time. Thank you very much, Jane, for taking the opportunity to share your faith story with us this morning. Good morning. My name is Landa Bolster, and I'm one of the pastoral care elders at our church. And this morning, I have the privilege to be able to lead us in a congregational prayer. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we come before you humbly as your people, thanking you for the new and goodness of the day that you have given us. We thank you for Sundays, and we thank you that Sundays represent a time of worship and rest. Dear God, we come before you as your people, thanking you for who you are. We thank you for being our Father, and we thank you and praise you for your creative goodness and your creative genius. We thank you for the gift of your Son Jesus in our lives, and we thank you that that represents redemption, that that represents newness in our lives, and we pray that you would help us to shine that forth in this world as we live our lives reflecting Jesus. And we thank you so much for the gift and power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you that that gift allows us the opportunity to believe and gives us power to live our lives for Jesus. Dear God, we live in a world that is just difficult. There is COVID in our world and after 14, 15 months, it's becoming tiresome. But we pray for perseverance. We pray for healing. We thank you so much for the fact that we have science and engineering to be able to combat this virus. But we pray that as a people of this world, we would be also agents of reconciliation, of mercy and of redemption and of betterness and goodness in this world. And we pray that also as we see injustices happening in the past and in the present in our world today. The recent unearthing of graves of indigenous children out west is, is shocking and, and we really don't even know what to think. But it represents another sense of injustice and we pray that you would be with us, that you would help us that you would help us as a society and as people of your kingdom to recognize injustices and to redeem them. Dear God, we thank you that we see new seasons appearing before us. We're now in a time between spring and summer and we see new life all around us. It's a blessing and it gives us a hint of what we have to look forward to in our eternal life. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our church body, and we thank you for each member within it. It's so difficult because we don't see each other right now, 
but we still hold together and we want to claim the fact that we are a family in Jesus. We thank you for our church and we pray for its leaders. We pray for administrative elders, for pastoral care elders, and for deacons, and we pray that you would be with them and bless them and cause them to be a blessing as they carry out their duties within our church. And we pray the same for our staff. We've got a wonderful complement of staff that lead us, and although virtually now and somewhat in the background it seems, we pray that you would continue to bless them as they lead programs and ministries and as they overall have a leadership role within our church community. Dear God, we've got a number of individuals within our church that need special prayer. We've got seniors that just want to reach out and hug a grandchild. We have seniors who are dealing with some loneliness and we've got other people, singles, etc., that may be dealing with loneliness as well. Dear God, we pray that you would be with them and that you would bless them and that in some way through this COVID restrictions, we would still be able to experience the love for each other and the love that we experience in Jesus. We pray especially also for people within our church congregation who may have specific health needs. We pray that you would be with them, that you would allow for healing to happen in their lives. And we pray that also for people who are experiencing difficulties with mental health issues. This seems to be so much more prevalent in today's world, and we pray that you would be with those people who suffer from these mental disorders of anxiety, depression, and other mental conditions as well. Dear God, we pray that as a church and as church family, we also would be seen as agents of healing in this world today. Dear God, we thank you so much for relationships. We thank you that you have created us as relation beings. And through that, we experience support and love and encouragement. But we thank you so much for the knowledge of the same in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love and encouragement and support that we have through that relationship with Jesus. And now we want to take an opportunity to pray for enlightenment. We pray that as you bring Pastor Phil to us this morning to bring forward your word, we pray that you would enlighten and inspire us. And we pray a special blessing on Pastor Phil. He's going to bring our, the word of God to us and we're going to hear it. But later we will able to use, be able to use some of our other senses as well as we use the sight, smell, taste, and touch senses to experience Jesus through the communion uh, ceremony. So God, we wanna thank you for your goodness and love. We pray for your enduring faithfulness in our lives. And we pray that you would help us to be redeeming agents in this world today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Good morning, Clearview. Today's offering is for the Vergara family, who, as many of you know, answered God's call to serve as missionaries in their home country of Colombia. Clearview, as their home church, continues to support the Vergara family financially, but also spiritually, and Marco and Laura are encouraged by our prayers and messages of support. Marco and Laura are here to give us a personal update on their next steps in following Jesus. Good morning, friends, family, church. Colombia is going through a historic moment right now and God gave us the opportunity to be here. So we can tell you a little bit about what's going on here on this short video. As many of you remember, we will return to serve here after a peace treaty that was signed in 2016. Colombia had a long history of violence that left the country exhausted and divided. The church has had an important role to play in the reconstruction of this society. However, the political and social division continue. Colombia's economy has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Colombia's poverty rate has risen to 42.5%. 
and this population lived with $150 a month average. The hospital's capacity has been to its max since January 2021, and the education system, just to mention a few of the problems, continue to be a privilege for some, with a regular student that invests a fortune in university struggles to find a job. The drop that filled the cup was a tax reform presented by the Congress last April. It affects the people struggling with a basic income and favors the big companies and financial institutions. People went on the streets to protest everywhere, closing main roads and causing the country to stop. Some of these pacific protests turned into a battlefield as they found police and army responding and using extreme force against the civilians. Knowing the history of our country, this is just like trying to stop a fire with gunpowder. It has been 35 days since the protest began, and so far no truce has been reached, nor a range been made to stop the violence. Many have lost their lives during this protest, and many have disappeared. But this is not just the social history of Colombia. It has happened in Chile, in Mexico, even in Canada. This is not the problem of a country. This is the problem of the human heart. During our weekly meetings, we're studying the prophets, Micah, Amos, Habakkuk, who spoke about this issue and against injustice and called people to confront the problems and to repent. We are mobilizing people to use their gifts, to pray for others, to be generous, and this Sunday, Jan 6, we will be gathering at our church to receive grocery bags and letters of hope to bring to families in several parts of the city. As a church, we have decided not to remain silent or indifferent. We decided to make a stop to hear the word of God and to try to understand the issues and act upon it. We live in a world where injustice happens at all levels. Our families, our companies, our relatives, our kids, they're all affected by it. But for us Christians, this is a reminder of the great need of God that it's out there. That's, that is why we, the church, are so crucial in this moment. We cannot remain silent. We are the voice that is called to announce the hope that it is in Jesus only. Injustice can show itself in many forms. It can touch us in many ways and we can get very frustrated. But justice has to be defined within the will of God and not by our own hands. Let's bring God into the equation. Start reading your Bible and be challenged by it. Jesus himself, being just, had to go through a lot of injustice. So he knows more than you and me, and he can use me, and he can use you right where we are. We can certainly fight for a better tomorrow. We can change some institutions. We can change structures. But what we need the most is a change of heart. And that can happen right now if we return to God, if we repent. Please continue to pray for this mission, for this country for the people that are in really need of Jesus out there. And thank you for supporting us. We pray for you. We love you. God bless you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Good morning again, friends. Welcome to church and welcome to our continuing series on the practices of Jesus. We are learning how we might arrange our lives around these practices of the life of Christ. See, Jesus invites each one of us into this extravagant salvation life, this glorious life of grace. And it's not something that we can find on our own or win or merit. This is entirely a gift of grace to us. But that doesn't mean there's nothing we do. Jesus says there is something we do. The secret to experiencing this life and this joy that Jesus has for us is to abide in him, to remain in him. And in the book of Acts, from that passage we just heard read to us, we get a picture for how this works. How do we together, as a community of faith, remain in Jesus together? 
The writer of the book of Acts, his name is Luke, Dr. Luke, he has in the book of Acts just described the events of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then he's provided for us an explanation on the meaning of Pentecost, what was going on. And he did that through the Sermon of Peter. And now Luke gives us little pictures, little vignettes of the effects, the impact of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. And Luke shows us how the Holy Spirit is creating a community that is devoting itself to practicing the way of Jesus. And I think there's a really interesting and important dynamic here that I don't want us to miss. Luke shows us powerful acts of God, God at work, coming through his spirit, transforming the disciples into these bold witnesses of Jesus Christ. We see God's spirit moving among the disciples, inspiring this radical generosity, bringing hope, bringing purpose. There was this awareness, expectation, God is on the move. And so the church enjoyed the favor of all people. We see God using the church, empowering the church to heal, to bless. God grows the church. 3,000 people join the church in that one day. Every day, God was adding to their, their number. This is what God does. And so Luke outlines those things that only God can do. But He also next outlines things that the church does to participate in the work God is doing. Because it would be mistaken for us to sort of shrug our shoulders and say, oh, look at God do his thing. It's all up to God, isn't it? We don't do anything. Not much for me to do here. Whether I grow, whether we as a church grow, really that's up to God, not us. No, that's not it. Luke shows us, no, there are things only God can do, absolutely. And then there are ways and practices that we are called to participate in what God is doing. There is a way that we can join and participate in God's work that results in our growth, in our becoming like Jesus. There is a way where we participate in what God is doing and we experience God as the deep center of our daily lives where friendship with Jesus is woven into the fabric of everything we do. We've been focusing on the practices of Jesus for the past few weeks because it seems that in the contemporary church we've forgotten or neglected these ordinary ways by which we participate in God's work. And so we're missing out often on what God does. Now, we're people who are eager to live our lives on purpose for God. I'm convinced of that. We're here. We're watching a live stream because we want to know Jesus. We want to participate in what God's doing. But I think we also have the question of how do we do this? How do we do this in our day and age, in this day and age of smartphones and uh, social media, in the midst of a culture that, that is seemingly profoundly in opposition to the way of Jesus and that shapes our life away from Christ? How, in that context, do we live out this life? I think the truth is that too many of us live our lives not practically organized around Jesus as a center. I find that we can be as disordered, as frazzled, as discontented and confused as those outside the church. We're often distracted by so many things that pull us in all sorts of directions. Now, I think this can feel especially acute now, but it's not anything new. Previous generations of God's people have always wrestled with how do we live with God? How do we follow God in our everyday lives? But the difference is previous generations also had very clear ways of shared life that fostered and grew holiness and devotion. Acts 2 presents us with a pretty simple, pretty clear picture for how that early church lived, arranging their lives around God, how they participated in God's powerful work. Uh, This is such a powerful passage. I think if there's one passage that we got to cling to, to guide and define our church, this is it. Now, I want to press the pause button here for a minute because I imagine you've heard this passage already. I imagine you know this passage. You're already thinking of some other things, right? You've heard enough sermons on this passage Can I just say stop? Because you know what? God is always about to speak when Scripture is opened. And so i got to ask, are you ready to hear a fresh word from God? Because the Spirit of God is going to 
imprint this word on our hearts today. Here in Acts 2, we are witnessing a fascinating reality. The early church is devoting themselves to practicing the way of Jesus in community. The power of Pentecost, think of that. The power of Pentecost now is totally channeled, funneled into, into what? Simple, tangible, communal practices. That is how the Spirit manifests itself. The community devotes themselves to everyday shared faith practices. And this is the picture that Luke shows us of a spirit-filled, empowered church through which God does the miraculous. The church throughout the book of Acts is a community knit together in these loyal relationships, this living network of persons who are committed to practicing the way of Jesus in a common life together. So do you want to see God renew and empower our lives? That's work only God can do. But let us devote ourselves to what we can do. These practices, these ways that we do what is in our power to do that then allows God to do what only God can do. These practices, faith practices, they are the places of encounter with the living God, with the Spirit of God. And so the church devoted themselves to these. This is the first effect, the first manifestation of the power of the Spirit, this devotion. Take close note here. One of the signs, the clearest signs of the Spirit at work in you and my life is devotion. Not a fickle sort of faith, but a continuous, persistent tenacity, a a settled, daily, and devoted practice. These followers of Jesus, they were dedicated, they were faithful, they were consistently arranging their lives around this community, around this way of Jesus. It took their time their money, their priority. It was a committed devotion to the life of Jesus, to the way of Jesus. Another way of saying it is they rearranged their lives, they reorganized their daily lives around the way of Jesus. They had jobs, they had families, just like we do, but they intentionally prioritized and reordered their daily life, their daily way of living, to place Christ at the center of it. Which makes me wonder, how are we doing Isn't it easy, so easy, to get drawn away from the life of Jesus to so many other ways of living? And so it's a good question for us to ask, what are you devoting yourself to? Look at your life. Look at the priorities in your life. What are you arranging your life around? Can I encourage you this week to take time to assess the devotion of your life? Because the Spirit is always moving us towards this devoted life around Jesus. The disciples knew these practices were the places where they met the Spirit of God. And so we read about um, four communal shared practices that were very formative and shaped the life of the church. They were the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now let's quickly look at each of those. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The other church was devoted to instruction that linked the the disciples to the continuing way of Jesus. And so the church formed a learning community of sorts. There was regular teaching, regular engagement with Scripture. That was just normative. That was part of their lives. There was this deep devotion and love for God's Word. The Bible is the testimony to God's activity in this world. It is the authority for our life, for our practice. So church, how is our daily lives organized around God's word? Is scripture uh, maybe an afterthought to a busy week or is it the north star guiding our living? Secondly, the church devoted itself to the fellowship. Fellowship, it's a pretty churchy word, isn't it? So let's sort of break it down. Since we as broken human beings have found friendship, acceptance with a holy God. We are accepted. We are loved. We now also have friendship with others. This vertical fellowship with God, the friendship with God, turns horizontal. And so we are a community as a church that transcends race and gender and economic status because of what Jesus has done. All those barriers, they're irrelevant. And so fellowship it's, it's more muscular than after-church coffee conversation. Fellowship is more like a sacrificial sharing that gets expression as we participate in God's life 
It is found in things like the support of the poor in the community, the sharing of resources. We read about that in verse 44 to 45 of Acts 2. That was a natural extension of this fellowship, this shared communal life. They practiced fellowship. Do you know how prophetic that practice is today? Because we live in one of the loneliest cultures of all time. There is this individualist ethos in our culture that almost creates a debilitating social isolation. So many people are alone, so many left longing for connection. And this simple, ordinary, everyday practice of fellowship, of community, I think it's one of the most prophetic witnesses of the church in our age of isolation. The Spirit tears down walls of pride and prejudice and privilege and creates this community of the beloved. Now, closely connected to this practice of fellowship, the church committed, devoted itself to breaking bread together. Such an ordinary, everyday thing, breaking bread together. This habit of fellowship got expressed in regular hospitality as again witnessed in verse 46 of chapter 2, where it says they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Think of that. The simple sharing of a meal, again, is one of these formative Jesus practices where the Spirit meets us. It's a profoundly Spirit-filled practice. I always say that Jesus does his best work over a meal, and the Holy Spirit continues that work. Just watch what God does when you invite someone out for a coffee or into your home for a meal. And I hope we can do that very soon. Because around a table, in that context of hospitality, Jesus is there. He's present with his power to heal and to bless. The Spirit inhabits that practice. And the church practiced the sort of regular hospitality because it was rooted in the hospitality that God gave to us. And so the communion table... It's probably one of the richest expressions of God's welcome for us. God sets us a table of hospitality and welcome. He offers us a meal that speaks of friendship and love and welcome. And so this practice of breaking bread among one another, certainly it's a meal, but it also includes the communion meal, Lord's Supper. Because at the Lord's table, we commune with the living God. And God is so present there powerfully in the bread and the cup. It is a guaranteed means of grace, a place where we are promised we will encounter God. We're going to celebrate communion a little bit later in our service. But I got to tell you, my secret wish is that we could come to the table every Sunday. The communion meal is such a vital place where we meet and experience God. So why wouldn't we celebrate this every week? We need this reminder of our relationship with God, of our acceptance that we're part of the table, part of the family. I need to know that beautiful grace at the heart of our story, that Jesus welcomes all sinners, people, broken people like me, to join him at the table. And finally, the church devoted itself to prayer. The church was a worshiping church both formally and informally, at set times and in their fellowship together, in the temple, at their homes, joyfully and in reverence. The church was a praying, worshiping community. Worship is such a vital practice of the church. Don't neglect meeting for worship. And I'm glad you're doing this online, and we're looking forward to the day when we can be together to do this in person. Now, as a part of worship, the church practiced a regular form of prayer. It was an ordered cycle of daily prayers. There were set times throughout the day where Christians, followers of Jesus, would pause their daily activities. They would stop and they would pray. And so what they did is they reorganized their time, their schedule around God and around communion with God through prayer. They allowed the practice of prayer to interrupt their daily work, their daily activities, It was a daily practice that reminded them that we don't fit God. We don't squeeze God into our busy days. No, instead we arrange our days, our schedule around the life of God. And so in all these practices, what we see is a spirit-filled community of practice. They were devoted to the Jesus way of life. And they practiced it on a daily basis. Because these practices were the spirit-inhabited means of having Jesus formed in us. 
And so think of this. Are you looking to know God? Do you hunger more for an experience of the living God? These practices, they are the places where the Spirit chooses to work. They are the promised places of meeting God and knowing His power. And so we need to renew our understanding of these habits, is, of these habits and our practices and, and renew a, a, a powerful new understanding of their place in our spiritual formation. You know, the majority of our lives, 70% of our lives, studies show, is rooted in habit. One writer, James Clear, observes, the habits you follow without thinking determines the choices you make when you are thinking. And so we need the structure of habits to shape our lives with Jesus. And if we miss that connection of habit and our formation, I think we're going to become people who say we believe, but really don't live the way of Jesus in our regular lives. Our lives will be formed by other things than Jesus will become people who profess peace, but who really are shaped and formed in an anxiety. We'll profess hope, but we get formed in despair. We are people who might profess love, but get formed by all the conflict, the antagonisms of our day. So again, we come back to the question, how might we live out this way of Jesus again today, in our day and age? And the answer from the ancient church right up to today is to develop a rule of life. That's what we see here in Acts 2. The early church had clearly laid out a rule of life, a structure, a pattern of practice that guided them, that shaped them into this way of life. Acts 2, that passage we read, just shows us the early church's rule of life. Now, what's a rule of life? A rule of life is a planned and patterned form of living that guides us, individuals and communities, in pursuing life with God. I guess you could think of it as a structure for life to grow. I know the word rule, you hear that, and I bet the immediate reaction you have to that is something negative, some negative connotations. It's all about rules, but no, this is a rule of life. It's a singular. And the word rule comes from the Latin word regula, which means trellis. Think of a trellis for a minute. A trellis is used for a plant, a vine, for instance, to grow, or maybe your your tomato plants in your vegetable garden, for them to grow. They need some structure, some trellis. A plant, naturally, as it grows, it, it will naturally use anything to support its growth. It's almost like the part of the life force, the nature of a growing plant, to seek out structure. And a trellis is that sort of support structure that enables a plant to grow and bear fruit. And that same reality works in our life with Jesus. A rule of life supports our friendship with Jesus. We need a structure to help us grow and bear fruit. And so a rule of life is that structure. And it is composed of intentional, regular, embodied practices that we set out in advance. And they provide a framework upon which God's work of spiritual formation can happen. And the church grows through this. And it's not for, you know, spiritually elite. Maybe you think, oh my goodness, that's for professional Christians, right? No, no. One author, Simon Chan, says living by a rule is what turns someone into a regular Christian. There's a connection between the word regular and regular. Living by a rule is what turns someone into a regular Christian. And the rule itself, that's not what changes us. Rather, a rule simply provides the space, the structure, the support for God to grow his life in us. It helps create that space for us to respond to God, to our neighbor, to ourselves, rather than just react to what happens. So a rule of life, then, is this pattern that supports and structures our living. And a rule of life has always been a central piece of the spiritual formation of God's people throughout history. And I think this is such a critical matter for our time because we live in this post-Christian secular age where the the meaning map we once had has been thrown out. And that's led to the dismantling of 
previous patterns and structures that previously helped direct and organize and arrange our lives. You know, there was a day when there were support structures in society that tended to encourage faith. There were sort of these cultural nudges that directed people towards at least a semblance of faithful living. I can still remember a time when there was no Sunday shopping. All the stores, all the restaurants, most of them were closed. Maybe even gas stations. They were all closed on Sundays. And that was a culture-wide structure that encouraged Sabbath and worship. But that, along with all the other social support structures that may have nudged people towards faithful living, they are gone. And along with it, the shared way of life that once fostered holiness or devotion or obedience, that's gone. It's been discarded. People now think of it as, oh, just quaint legalism, or maybe it was an overly pious ideal for more elite-level Christians. But here's the thing. Nothing has replaced it. The supports, the structures, the, the faith formation architecture, I guess you could call it, that cultivates, that sustains faithful followers of Jesus, it's missing. And so we need to reclaim this vital structure for our spiritual formation. And again, what's in sight with a rule of life? It's not elite faith. It is regular Christianity. It's the ordinary living out of everyday faith, the small acts of prayer and service and devotion, the daily habits of love that get cultivated and trained through a rule of life. A rule of life is the faith formation architecture for everyday Christianity. And I mentioned this, I think, a couple of weeks ago, but what a rule does is it brings together our desire for God and discipline. All of us have a genuine desire to live life in communion with God. That's where it all begins, with this desire to know God, to follow Jesus more fully. But a rule of life recognizes that our hearts can be fickle. We want to pray, we want to read scripture because we desire God. We want to be able to serve others with compassion and grace because we're compelled by Jesus. But then we also know, yeah, there's times when we don't feel that desire at all. When we get so busy that that's the last thing we can think of. And so what we do is we set up a structure of practices and relationships. We put in place disciplines that keep our lives centered on God when our desires falter and fail us. So desire launches us into life with Jesus. But the rule of life, a pattern and structure, keep us regularly there, following Jesus in communion with God. And so obeying Jesus through the structure of a rule of life, through these intentional shared practices, it is a critical part of spiritual transformation. It's the way in which God releases his power among us. It's what we see the early church doing. It's what God can do among us again. And if you're interested in seeing what this might look like in your life or here at Clearview, how we might be a community gathered around the practices of Jesus in a rule of life, check out the sermon worksheet today. It's posted in the YouTube notes. And it is really just an invitation for you to explore how we as a church can arrange our lives around the practice of Jesus, how we can uh, live out a rule of life together and devote ourselves to the way of Jesus. We want to do this because the Spirit of God is still at work, stirring up his church. The Spirit of God still meets us in these faith practices. Across the world, God is doing what only God can do, blessing, healing, renewing, growing his church. So let us devote ourselves to what we can do. Practicing the way of Jesus, the habits where the Spirit meets us. And we do this in the hopeful expectation for God to do among us what only God can do. Amen. Welcome to Communion. I hope you've been able to prepare elements of a cup and bread before you to celebrate communion with us. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, friends, and it is made ready for all those who love Jesus and for those who want to love him more. So the invitation is come. Come all you who hunger and thirst, you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world, come because the Lord Jesus invites you. 
as we prepare to enjoy communion, would you pray with me? Gratitude and praise and hearts lifted high, voices that are full and joyful. God, these are the things you deserve. Because when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no faith and no future, you called us your children, beloved. And so we praise you, God. We praise you for the goodness of creation. We praise you for coming to earth and entering time and space in Jesus Christ. We praise you for his life, which shapes our living, for his fearless dying on the cross, for his rising to new life. We praise you and worship you. And now we praise you for the promise of the Holy Spirit, your very life that lives within us. And we ask, God, that you would now send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and upon this cup. Fill them with the fullness of Jesus. Feed us with the life of Christ through them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. friends gathered around a table Jesus took bread he blessed it and he broke it and he said this is my body which is given for you so take eat remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for you we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. In the dark of night, before the And at the same supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and he said, this is my new relationship with God made possible because of my death. So take and drink this cup, the precious blood of Jesus spilled out so that the sins of many might be forgiven.
We are sent out into this world with the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Amen.